So we don't have to ask a blessing on the Bible study per se. Um, I'm changing gears on you. Uh, I had talked in terms of, we have finished the book of Malachi here, correct? Everybody tells me, yeah, we finished the book of Malachi. So we're finished with the minor prophets. I was planning on going into the New Testament. I'm still going to do that someday. Uh, because I think it'll be a challenge for me, and I think uh, I think you'll enjoy it. But it turns out my wife and some other individuals yesterday at the Pates, at Alicia Pates' uh, graduation party, uh, were persuading me that uh, Dr. Meredith has addressed uh, the Gospels and some of these other things, and. You know, uh, Mr. Ulrich and Mr. Graves are both working in the New Testament, so that uh, they were kind of saying that maybe what we should do is what I've talked about off and on that I'd like to do. And frankly, as I've gotten back into it, I think this fits very, very well with our completion of the Minor Prophets, and that is to return to the book of Isaiah. So, uh, the book of Isaiah is acknowledged by the Jews as the the major book of prophecy outside of the Pentateuch. Now they have a high regard for the Pentateuch being written by Moses and so forth. They would say this is the major book outside of the Pentateuch. In many ways I wouldn't necessarily make it an either or. The book of Isaiah fits with everything we've heard so far in the minor prophets and adds a great deal to it. For one, it's not a minor prophet. It is a major prophet. And, again, God could reveal... I can't tell you how often, brethren, I prepare the night before for these Bible studies. And when I actually give them, far more comes out in my reading of them when I give them than than in my preparation. I marvel at that because, you know, I'll see things I didn't see the night before. I've come to accept that, that that's part of the inspiration process that God goes through. So... uh, I think God is inspiring this return to Isaiah as a focus because Isaiah is such a meaningful book for the end times. There's a lot to be learned in the Gospels, don't get me wrong, but I have to admit we are facing, and I hope you guys are watching world news enough to know that we are on the verge of some very major things. Talk to, what was it, I was reading the Ladies Home Journal, or... uh, Church Ladies Journal or whatever Kathy Talbot calls it. And I think it was Barbara Sher. Now, Barbara Sher is probably pushing 85 years old. So she remembers the uh, depression directly. And she said uh, there were people who had been through the depression who said that they'd rather die than go through it again. Now, um, I don't think any of us born since the depression can fully relate with that. We are on the cusp of what could be worse than the depression. And personally, um, some of you who are on my news list have gotten an article that uh, by Arthur Laffer, Arthur Laffer, if you remember the Laffer curve from the 1980s, supply and demand, etc. He's an economist, and he says that with the tax changes that Barack Obama has and the Dem- Democratic, Democratic, as I call them, uh, Congress has put through, uh, that January 1st of 2011 will probably be a break day. Because that's when a lot of these taxes take place and it will kill economic activity. And frankly, I know it's a little hard for us to relate with, but personally I feel that this is exactly what the socialists want. If you read their literature, Rules for Radicals, even some of Karl Marx's writings and so forth, the way you restructure society according to your socialist ideal is you have to destroy capitalism first. And, you know, we are such a filthy rich nation, we have a long ways to fall. And uh, personally, it may happen before, but I think at least... All these massive tax changes are happening on January 1st, and many wealthy individuals and corporations are moving all of their income that they possibly can into 2010. That's the only reason we have any upsurge in economic activity right now, is they're trying to take their income now before these taxes take effect. After January 1st, nobody's going to want to sell any capital gains because the taxes are going to go up enormously on them. And so economic activity is going to go like this. 
Now, uh, what effect is that going to have? Well, we're teetering right now. The government will admit our, our unemployment rate is like 10%. Brethren, it is far more than 10%. They are massaging the numbers like you can't believe. Inflation, unemployment rate. Uh, we are not that far. You know what the unemployment rate was during the Great Depression? 25%. It's well understood that if you take the real, the real unemployment rate, it's closer to 20% right now. We are headed for a train wreck. And uh, yes, it's good if you prepare and you store some food and everything else, but believe me, that isn't going to get you through it. It's your relationship with God that's going to get you through tough economic times. And it's very possible that between now, well, you know... And, <laughs> That 20, 2017 date is not sounding too bad to me. Yes, Gene. Years ago, if you ran out of unemployment, they took you off the unemployment list. Yeah. And it was one of their scams. Well, it's <coughs> as bad as it is. Much the same way. The, you know, the only uptick in employment the last quarter was census hiring. And they were actually playing game with that. They would hire a person and fire them a week later. And then hire them back and count them as two hires. Same person. They're playing all kinds of games. So, you know, and this is all, as I got an email from a friend of mine last night, which echoed the commentary I had on the website back probably a year or so ago, that once a country's morals are so corrupt, you will see the effects in politics, in economics, in education, in government, in medicine, everything else, but the real core issue is the moral corruption. That's what's driving it. Because people are liars and thieves. Remember what we went through in was it Zech- Zechariah 4, I think it was, about the, the scroll that, that uh, brought out the curse on the nation? And one, one side it was against all thieves, and the other side it was against all liars. You cannot operate a society successfully when everybody is on the take. Or almost everybody. The majority is on the take. So, the book of Isaiah is going to speak specifically to that, and I think add to what we've covered with the minor prophets. It's not a small undertaking. There are 66 chapters in the book of Isaiah. I think it took me, uh, Cecil and Diana Roach are here. Well, where are you guys? How long did it take me to get through Isaiah? Yeah, but probably three years or more, I think, because we had the church history Bible studies after that. So, uh, uh, and I have grown to love the book of Isaiah as one of the richest books in the entire Bible. So I hope we can add to your appreciation of the book of Isaiah. Now, one thing, I am not heavily oriented on the historical details behind it. You get out, as I've mentioned before with the Minor Prophets, you get out a commentary and they'll spend page after page after page after page on historical detail. Why? Because they don't understand what the content of the book of Isaiah is about. They don't have a clue, so they've got to talk about something. So they'll talk about the historical details, which add very little to your understanding and the application of these prophecies for the end time. By the same token, if you get out of commentary, the reason most commentaries are worthless is they will spend page after page after page after page after page on textual criticism. Who wrote this? And maybe, you know, Isaiah was actually written by four different people and all this other malarkey. All of which has nothing to do with it because they don't believe the Bible. The Bible actually says, hey, <clears throat> Isaiah wrote it. Okay, that, that's okay by me and I'll go on from there. So you can take 90% of what they have written in those commentaries, rip it out and throw it away. It's of no value whatsoever. But again, to review the office of the prophet, uh, you know, there's no place in the Bible, it's interesting that God didn't do this, he didn't provide a glossary with the Bible where uh, you go back and you have a de- definition of what a prophet is and, and how that prophet's role changed from early times to later times, what a New Testament prophet was and so forth. You and I are left to understand that two ways. One, through government and instruction, by the way, which is interesting. Why does God do things that way? You know, It's like God, every step of the way through the Bible, supports the concept of government. Uh, there's so many things we don't understand in these prophecies. And he provides government as a large part of the way those questions are going to be answered. Amos 3, 7, I'm going to refer you to that again. Surely the Lord God does nothing, but he reveals his will to his servants, the prophets. Um, now, as we've attested too many times before, as we've discussed this, 
Um, if you have any dealings with the government of God, you know that it is not perfect. So God is upholding government that he understands just as much as you do that is not perfect. But it is better than the alternative. And what is the alternative to proper government? Chaos. And that's what we have in among the people of God today. Going 490 different directions. Every Tom, Dick, and Harry having no fear of God, appointing themselves a teacher and a prophet to God's people. You know, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And he is not going to take that lightly. In fact, he says many places, I, I, uh, what Mr. Um, why is it every time you turn on a computer, it wants to do everything other than what you want it to do? It wants to update every single piece of software on here when I'm trying to get work done. Um, anyway, uh, so I think that one's going to pop up again, too. Uh, so, you know, we have to understand the role of a prophet from the context of what they did. So, uh, and it's interesting, though, that when you ask that specific question of a, of a scholar, they can actually give you a relatively succinct and intelligent answer. For instance... From one uh, commentary or a dictionary I was reading, I think it was uh, oh new commentary on uh, the Old Testament, the introduction to prophetical books, it says the prophet was by office not only a declarer of events still future. That's what most of us think. A prophet, he predicts the future. He says, no. In fact, later on he says it's primarily not that. He says, not only a declarer of events still future, but the general preacher of the day. The prophet was actually exactly, in many ways, like the minister today. Um, He employed his time in counseling sinners to turn from the error of their ways and in making strong prayer and supplication to God to avert the threatened judgments. Now read Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and that's what you'll hear. Uh, The prophetic ministry includes both forth-telling predicting the future, and, I'm sorry, foretelling is not predicting the future. Uh, I'll have to redefine that. Prophetic ministry includes both foretelling and, to a lesser extent, foretelling. In other words, pr- prophesying the future. Foretelling reveals people's sins, calling them to repent and act according to God's law. It's inspired preaching, and that was the primary job of a prophet. Even Isaiah, who wrote one of the largest books of the Bible, 66 chapters, and had a ministry that probably extended as long as somewhat over 60 years. When you think about 60 years, think about what Dr. Meredith writes in in a given year. Book of Isaiah is like, doesn't hardly have more than a a sentence per year of uh, Isaiah's ministry. What else did he do? Well, obviously, he wasn't playing golf or tennis or, or rocking in a rocking chair. He had a job to do, and that was to do exactly what I'm doing today, what Dr. Meredith is doing, what all the ministers of God are doing, Mr. Ulrich and everybody else, is admonishing God's people, exhorting God's people in the way of God. Um, now, for those who, who would like a historical tie, the prophet Isaiah ministered during the days of Uzziah the king. Now, Uzziah was the guy that got leprosy, and uh, you know, and he had a long and a very prosperous reign. Israel was in pretty good shape, or Judah was in pretty good shape uh, during that period of time. Now, it wasn't. Now, this would have been somewhere uh, around 738 BC. Now, during the reign of Uzziah, but also Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, he had a long ministry. So as far as uh, perhaps into uh, the early part of the 600s B.C. Uh, Just as is today, in many ways, Isaiah describes our people today. Just as our leadership today has learned nothing from history. They actually think that they can do socialism better because they're smarter 
and therefore it'll work this time. When you look at the track record of history, track record of history is the socialism and totalitarianism, dictatorship, that kind of an approach to things where I don't care what you think, this is what we're going to do, doesn't work. And it does not produce prosperity and peace and, and comedy and everything else. Uh, despite the track record of history, we haven't learned anything. They think they can do it better because they're smarter. Arrogance. We're going to find out that arrogance, the hatred of arrogance, is one of the primary themes of the book of Isaiah. God hates human vanity and arrogance. So just as our people, our leaders today, are lousy students of history, the kings of Israel and Judah were lousy students of history. They had an incontrovertible track record that every time they did things their way, it blew up in their faces. And every time they did it God's way, it worked. When they got God as their partner, it didn't matter who was against them. When they rejected God as their partner and tried to go out and play politics, which is the height of human carnal working things out, it was an utter and a complete disaster every time. And they never learned that lesson. Those who refuse to learn from the mistakes of history are doomed to repeat them. Well, boy, isn't that the case in the history of Judah and Israel. Uh, you know, it, I, again, I've pointed this out before, but since, she, you know... I think it bears pointing out again to remind you. The way the world looks at it is David and Solomon's empire rose to its peak when it did because Assyria and Egypt and the major powers of the day were weak. It's the wrong way to look at it. Who made the major powers of the world weak so Israel could rise? God did. That's what happens when you partner with God. You don't need politics. You don't need diplomacy. You don't need negotiated treaties. Let God do the raising and the falling, and Israel and Judah, is, uh, under David and Solomon, is what you get. So that same thing happened under the time, in the time of Uzziah, because Assyria was relatively weak at the time, and it, the, the Israelites had this tendency which is exactly like our people today, that because sentence against an evil work is delayed, the heart of man is turned continually to evil, says in Proverbs. That's exactly the way they operated then. Things were going well under Uzziah. Forget Isaiah and everything he's saying. We don't need to listen to him. Because God did not immediately bring the Assyrian army marching down on them when they began to drift. They thought they were okay. They didn't need to worry about it. We're exactly in that state of mind today, brethren. I can't tell you this arrogance of the elite in our country and Western Europe, the Western societies, is so extreme that I'm beginning to come to a visceral understanding of why 90% of Israel has to die in the Great Tribulation. It's not by God's choice, it is by Israel's choice that 90% of Israel will die. Because they are that stiff-necked as a people. That filled with vanity and with arrogance and with self-will. This is the Laodicean era, the greatest era of self-will in mankind's history. Now... um, From a historical point of view, by the way, after the Assyrians took Israel into captivity, uh, you know who it was that helped bring down the Assyrian Empire? That marched right into Nineveh was the Scythians. Who were the Scythians? Scythians were Israelites. So it's interesting how they conquered Israel, took them into captivity, put them on the edge of their empire, that they became the Scythian peoples. Not, Not all the Scythians were Israelite, but most of them were. Parthian Empire, later on the Roman Empire, those were Israelites and they became the ones that helped conquer Assyria later on. In other words, it's kind of a historical example that even where God's people are not righteous, what goes around comes around. You know, so uh, just kind of an ironic uh, note of history. 
Now, the history of this time is very convoluted, and we could get, spend a lot of time on it, and I'm not sure that it would be very, all that profitable, but it's a time of intrigue and backdoor negotiations and stabbing in the back and revolt and covert alliances and political maneuvers and wiping out of, you know, of royal families and all this other type of stuff as much or more than any other time in history. But the core lesson is that Israel and Judah more consistently relied on scheming, revolting, allying with various political powers, politicking, um, diplomacy, and trying to work out their own physical salvation on their own terms. That was the primary approach of Israel and Judah for their entire existence, and it caused them nothing but grief. Their efforts totally failed, and eventually they lost their independence and lost possession of the Holy Land that God had promised to them, all because they refused to learn the lessons from their own history. They refused to rely upon God, even though it was in their own direct selfish interest to do so. You could be a king of Israel who would look at the history of Israel and say, look, I don't need particularly care if I have a relationship with God, but this is the best way to run things. You know, to, to, to keep the people on track, keep the priesthood on track, uh, because it's obvious from the track record of history that's the only time things work. In fact, it's interesting, God created this situation as it was. Where was the promised land? The promised land wasn't in Great Britain, surrounded by an ocean, easily defendable and much more easily defendable. The Holy Land, the promised land, was right in what you might call the interstate interchange of the Middle East. Every power, every army, the army that was going to fight with a major power eventually passed through Israel. So without God's express help, they were doomed as an independent people. The only hope they had was to rely upon God, and they wouldn't do it. So that's the lesson that we need to learn, and it's exactly, you know, put this on a, on a personal spiritual level. Every time you and I properly orient ourselves with God and put God first in our lives, it, it's the only time things are going to work. We drift away from God, we lean to our own understanding, we start trying to do things our own ways according to self-will of the Laodicean era, and it's going to blow up in our faces, guaranteed. And it, it breaks my heart that many in other groups are going to wake up, as Mr. O'Gwen put it, about an hour into the Great Tribulation, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I was just reading another uh, website, so there's 401 uh, groups that have broken off from worldwide. And another self-appointed guy has uh, set up this website and he's going to bring all the churches of God together and everything. And reading through it, I just thought, you know, it, it is more foreign than me, to me than Swahili to think that I would appoint myself to speak primarily for God. I cannot even identify with the mind frame that would do that. I know my place in the government of God, and it is not at the top. I've noticed that. Have you noticed that? It's not at the top. It's somewhere down toward the bottom. I know my place. And so for me to all of a sudden decide, I'm going to leapfrog ahead of everybody else that God has used out there and put myself up as the one who's going to teach them, I cannot comprehend that kind of arrogance. But we have thousands of people out there doing that. Brethren, why do I harp on that? Because they never intended to be this way too. They were subverted by Satan the devil. Why does he do that? Because it works. He has great success with it with one of the 52 cards. And he knows your hot buttons too, just like he knows mine. It is a miracle any of us have survived this long. And our job is to keep that miracle going. So, let's start in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah means Yahweh is salvation or the Lord shall save. Now that's a powerful, that's a real positive, powerful name to have. Again, I contrast that with Jonah, which means pigeon, dove. Okay, Not a strong name. Jonah was not a strong prophet. 
So uh, uh, the name Isaiah means Yahweh is salvation or the Lord shall save. Um, oh, by the way, I forgot to print off the uh, outlines with some other historical background. I'll try to do that next time. Diane, can you remind me of that, please? Um, again, I don't tend to focus so much um, on the historical background, so it's not as crucial. Um, it's interesting, uh, Isaiah is mentioned outside of the book of Isaiah in uh, 2 Kings 19 and 20, and in 2 Chronicles 26 and 20, uh, 32. Sorry, That's uh, 2 Kings 19 and 20, and 2 Chronicles 26 and 32. So he's mentioned there. But let's get into the book, and believe me, Isaiah doesn't waste any time getting interesting. So uh, we're going to get into some interesting stuff the first couple of chapters. Any questions or comments at this point? <laughs> Couldn't get my finger out of the... Um, okay, anyway. Okay, the vision of Isaiah the son of Amos. This is Isaiah 1, verse 1, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of, is of Judah. Now, again, I'll, I'll contrast this with many of the minor prophets that we talked about that, that we did not know their historical tie. They, they weren't, we weren't given any details. We're given a fair number of details about Isaiah. Um, and so we can peg him in history, as I told you, in terms of uh, 738 B.C. or whatever it was. So this is the message God gave to Isaiah uh, via, uh, or to Israel via Isaiah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the... Judah and Jerusalem. I'm sorry, Judah and Jerusalem. Uh, Israel was probably already in captivity. No, 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 not yet. So he uh, actually, okay, now what he says here, that's a good question, because you do have to pay attention to who is being addressed. By the way, uh, all right, um, he addresses it, thank you, Diane, for pointing that out, Judah and Jerusalem. So this has a Judean focus. Many of the prophets, many of the prophets spoke to both houses. But many of the other ones had a primary target. Oh, you need a... Oh. Thank you. Hmm. So anyway. uh, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Now, some of you parents who have uh, raised a family have had this feeling before. Uh, Hopefully not many of you, but this is not an uncommon thing. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. God has used this metaphor many times over, that he's a father to Israel, and what he's gotten back has not been commensurate with what he's given. The ox knows its owner and the donkey its master's crib. These dumb animals know uh, what hand fed them and took care of them and provided for them. But Israel does not know. My people do not consider. Why? Because of the same reason it's happening in this country. You get fat and sassy and you quit worrying about pleasing God. It seems that's... And that's one of the reasons, by the way, not many of us are fat and sassy. Well, okay. Uh, money, money-wise. Um <laughs> Some of us may be otherwise, but uh, but that's one of the reasons. You know, we always joke about getting publishers clearing house knocking at our door. There's a reason that hasn't happened. In most cases, God knows what the effect would be. Now, again, there are a few wealthy people in the church, and and uh, more power to them. But uh, it hasn't happened to me yet, and I haven't known too many others it's happened to. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's crib. But Israel does not know, and my people do not consider. A last sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a brood of evil doers, children who are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked to anger the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away backward. You couldn't more succinctly describe exactly where we are in this country today. We are an arrogant, sinful, corrupt nation. And we're doing it right in God's face. And because he hasn't slapped us down, we, we take pride in it. And he talks about that a little bit later. We are a nation that's wicked and pr- proud of it. 
Why should you be stricken again? You will revolt more and more. He's saying, you know, it's useless to even try to punish you in some ways, although it doesn't stop him. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faints. It's an apt description of our entire society. We are rotten from the top down. Um, From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it. But wounds and bruises and putrefying sores, they have not been closed up or bound up or soothed with ointment. We're a nation that cannot even manage our own self-interest. We can't control our borders. We can't... uh, You know, it's funny. I was reading an article the other day on, on how successfully Satan has destroyed the sexual roles of the family in our society. And how... The homosexual agenda has has, uh, uh, advanced as much as it has over the past few years. What percentage of the population is homosexual? They like to claim 10%. It's more like 3 or 4. Okay? Why do they have an effect far beyond their numbers? It's due to the moral corruption of the rest of us. So God sees us as that morally corrupt. We are putrefying. We're a rotting body. We're dead on our feet. We don't realize it yet. Just like, by the way, very accurately, we are bankrupt in this country. We just don't know it yet. So the daughter of Zion is... Oh, no, see, no, sorry. uh, Verse 7. Your country is desolate, your cities are burned with fire. Strangers devour your land in your present, and it is, and it is desolate, always overthrown by strangers. That hasn't happened yet, but it's coming. So the daughter of Zion is left as a booth in a vineyard, a hut in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Now, what is a booth in a vineyard or a hut in a garden of cucumbers? It's a temporary structure that blows down the next storm that blows through. It's nothing permanent, it's nothing solid. And it, uh, it, you just the workers in the vineyards put those up to shelter them for, for a couple of days while they're doing the harvest or whatever. Unless the Lord of hosts had left to us a very small remnant, we would have become like Sodom, we would have been made like Gomorrah. What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? Utter destruction. Complete construction and destruction. He's saying, unless the Lord of hosts had left us to us a very small remnant. Now, his descriptive, the adjectives there are important. A very small remnant. Not just a remnant, a very small remnant. We'll see a little bit later in Isaiah how that is defined as one tenth of the population of Israel. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. So God considers our people Sodom and Gomorrah. That's how far down we have come. We are the most blessed people on the face of the earth because of our ancestor, the righteousness of our ancestor Abraham. And we have not appreciated it at all as a people. We had a brief period of time there after our founding when we kind of counted our blessings and knew where they came from. But that pretty much after the Civil War, that all started to go downhill pretty quick. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me? We have the highest church-going population virtually in the world. We have more churches. I can't. It always blows me away when I drive down the street and see this new church going up, a several million dollar church. All of these churches, and what effect does it have on our righteousness? None whatsoever. It's hollow. To what purpose is a multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of your burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or the lambs or goats. Okay, he was talking in terms of the religious practices of that time. If he were talking about today, he said, I'm sick of your churches. I'm sick of your hallelujah choruses that have no meaning. I'm sick of your kind of religion. Bring, uh, when will you come to appear, uh, or when you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? So he's saying, I'm not asking for you to serve me the way you're serving me. I've told you how I want to be served. And what is our people, our so-called Christian nation today? Mr. Ulrich talked a little bit about this. Whether you're talking about some parts of the Jews recognize this, the Catholics recognize it too. 
I don't care what the Bible says. This is what we're going to do. They don't care what God says. And because they get away with it today and tomorrow and the day after, they think they're okay with God. They don't know God. So he says, to what purpose is the multitude of your religious service? He says, I have had enough of it. I don't want any more of it. Again, this is great background to the book of Hosea. Where in the book of Hosea, we have at least three times Israel tries to repent. And the first two times, God rejects it. Now we know why. We have our kind of religion. And by the way, brethren, you and I are not immune to that kind of an attitude. Because that's exactly what's happening with many of the 400 other groups. They want to be the ones to call the shots. Because they don't like the ones God has put to call the shots. And you know whether you like the ones God has called the the, the call the shots or not is irrelevant. You don't have to like me, and some don't. You do, if you're going to be a profitable member of the Church of God, have to work with my office, just like I have to work with every office above me all the way up to Jesus Christ. When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hands to trample my courts? Bring me no more, bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. Your form of religion, he's saying, makes me sick. I can't stand it. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out my, your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. So they know how to make the form of seeking God. Tearing their clothes in those days. We don't do that today. But we go through the process of um, the form of religion without any substance. The form of religion that this country is so good at is, is go down to Christian bookstores that, uh, in Federal Way and, and walk through there. And I, 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 I know I've teased you about, uh, about this before. I'll, I can only take it for about a half hour before the syrup just starts to stick to my feet too much and I have to get out. Why are they so focused on form over substance? Because they don't have substance and deep down inside they know it. They have to concentrate on form. So God says, you can go through all of the forms of religion you want. I will hide my eyes from you. Which again, as I say, harkens back to Hosea, where God says he would not listen to their... You you did not cry out to me with your heart when you wept upon your bed. You know, God knew they weren't sincere. They weren't ready to repent. Um, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. So he's saying, I'm going to suggest a totally different approach. Wash yourselves, make yourself clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Why does he say that? Because God's form of righteousness is comparatively simple. Do things his way. You know, and what Mr. Ulrich brought up, and I didn't realize to the extent that there were some Orthodox Jews that even recognized this, that just as Catholicism puts the church ahead of the Bible, so Judaism puts uh, the rabbis ahead of the Bible. That boggles my mind. Um, And so God is saying, you know, do away with all of this form of religion and let's get down to the real truth of religion, which is illustrated, by the way, most perfectly, I think, in the the, uh, crucifixion story. As I've mentioned many times here, the, the Jews were more oriented to ritual purity than they were to doing righteousness. They would rip off a widow at a drop of a hat. They would condemn an innocent man that they knew to be a prophet of God to death, they would murder that man. But boy, they didn't want to defile themselves so they could still take the Passover. That mindset, it just blows a circuit breaker in my mind. I can't relate with it. But to them, 
in their own perverted way, it made sense. And this is what God is saying right here. Get, a rid, get a rid of all of that form of religion that you've cluttered things up with. Let me give you a new concept. Repent. Put away evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. A Pharisee would go, huh? Defend the widow? Yeah, you know, uh, uh, she owes me money. How can I defend her? (laughs) Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord, though your sins are like scarlet. Now, notice that even in the face of this extremely offensive approach to religion that his people have adopted, God exhibits perfect mercy. He says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they shall be as uh, as wool, white as wool. Now, think about what God is really saying there. He's contrasting. Any of you ever seen blood on wool? Bright red blood on wool? Okay, you couldn't hardly have a more, a greater contrast. To, to the whiteness of pure washed wool. And God says, this is what you are. I can make you like this. And I'm willing to, but you've got to do it my way. If you are willing and obedient, oh, now there's the rub. That's what they never could get themselves to. You shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse, refuse and rebel, okay, that's what they did. You shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord is spoken. And what happened in ancient times? Israel and Judah, devoured by the sword. Because they did not, they were not willing and and obedient. They did refuse and rebel. How the faithful city has become, oops, a harlot. It was full of justice, righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. So it did have its brief period of time under righteous uh, kings and so forth when it exhibited righteousness, but it didn't sink into the people. Your silver has become dross, your wine mixed with water. Your princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Now this again describes our society. Now Mr. Plagenza, when he goes over to Africa, sees this maybe a little more directly. We don't... Our backsheesh, our, our uh, bribery in this country is a little less blatant than it is in Africa, but it's still there. Our leaders are corrupt down to their core, and almost all of them are corrupt. There's hardly a congressman that goes to Congress on his $175,000 a year salary who does not come out of Congress a millionaire. Now... It's not because he saves his nickels real well off that $175,000 salary. It's not because he just really knows how to invest that stuff. There's a reason. Our entire government is corrupt. Everyone loves bribes and follows after rewards. Everyone has their lobbyists and their people who pay them money for various things in return. They do not defend the fatherless, nor does the cause of the widow come before them. They couldn't care less about justice. And here, again, in most cases, all I have to do is say, what has been your interaction with the justice system? In most cases, you don't get justice. The only way you get justice is if you pay for it. They do not defend the fatherless, nor does the cause of the widow come before them. Therefore, says the, the, the Lord says, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, ah, I will rid myself of my adversaries and take vengeance on my enemies. Now, that should bring to mind a scripture in uh, a couple of places. But in the New, New Testament, one place it says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Why do people willing to set themselves up up as teachers and prophets today in in the 401 churches of God? It's because they have no fear of the God who says, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Yes, sir. Scripture kind of finds a home in my head somewhere. It has to do with the Lord will do nothing. Uh, He doesn't see a scripture like that? Uh, it's not ringing a bell with me. 
the wording. Oh, yeah, okay, I remember that scripture. Sure, yeah, there is one that talks in terms of that, which is kind of echoing what Proverbs says about because sentence of an evil work is, is delayed. Uh, it is human nature. And in fact, it, with your kids, it's the same way. Um, if there's one key I could tell you young parents as far as child rearing, train your kids to listen the first time. You ever watch a parent who goes, Johnny, I said, stop that. Johnny, stop. Johnny, if you don't stop that, you know what's going to happen. Johnny, I mean it this time. Johnny's sitting there trying to figure the odds. When, when, when is, when is the, the parent serious? Tell them once. And then follow with consequences. If you can train kids, to, you'll find out they'll listen that first time. It's possible. It's a little harder work for the parent, but it works. In the long run, it's less work. So, uh, he says, Therefore I will rid myself of my enemy my adversaries, take vengeance on my enemies. I will turn my hand against you and thoroughly purge away your dross and take away all your alloy. Now, this sounds positive because he says I will restore your judges as, as the first and counselors at, as at the beginning afterwards you shall be called a city of righteousness a faithful city ok he just condensed all of end time prophecy into a couple of verses I will turn my hand against you and thoroughly purge away your dross and take away all your alloy how do you take away alloy from a, uh, impure silver you heat it up and you skim it off now, it is, you might say to the rock that goes into that kiln, or smelter, it is a trial. It's, the rock doesn't want to change its form, doesn't want to give up the silver in it and then have the, the, the waste dross drawn away. And the heat of the trial, what he's talking about, I'll turn my hand against you, I'm going to beat the living, pardon me, out of you. And that is what's going to... Uh, purge the dross off. And then, after that's all done, well, we have the positive end. The city of righteousness restored everything else. We know that. And God, by the way, again, through Isaiah, you hear the, this, this thing that I've mentioned before with regard to the indictment, the punishment, the hope. That formula is going to be repeated dozens of times throughout the book of Isaiah. And he, and he does it right here. So he's done the indictment up to this point, and he says, in verse 24, he says, I'm going to get rid of my adversaries, I'll turn my hand against you, the judgment, and then he ends it with the hope. I will restore your judges as at the first, and your counselors as at the beginning. Afterward you shall be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion shall be redeemed with justice and repentance with righteousness. The destruction of transgressors and sinners shall be uh, together. And those who forsake the Lord shall be consumed. They, have, they shall be ashamed of the terebinth trees which you have desired. Now, we don't worship under forest groves anymore, overtly. overtly. Uh, but uh, he's talking about the religious practices of the time, the way they chose to do their worship. So it's analogous directly to, he's speaking directly to our form of worship today, as he talked about earlier in the chapter. They shall be ashamed of the terebinth trees which you have desired and shall be embarrassed because of the gardens which you have chosen, which is all part of their worship process. For you shall be as a terebinth whose lead, leaf fades and as a garden that has no water. The strong shall be as tender in the work of it as a spark that both will burn together and no one shall quench them. And again, this kind of a theme is, is uh, done throughout Isaiah where God says, doesn't matter how strong you are, doesn't matter how swift you're, the horse you're on, how, how good you are with the sword. When I bring judgment, you're going to feel judgment. Now, again, well, there are a lot of people. I go up to Alaska, and so, uh, Mr. Ulrich can attest to this. Part of what makes Alaskan Alaskans is they're already three-quarter survivalists. So, you know, they're pretty confident that when society falls apart, they've got their gun, they've got their cabin in the woods, and they can take care of themselves. They can survive this. Um... And then you have every other form of it. You have millionaires who have their little hideaways with their 10 years worth of dehydrated food, and they're going to survive it too. No, they're not. God is going to make the world so utterly miserable that if you're strong, if you have many guns, if you have much food, it's not going to help you. Uh, the Great Tribulation will come knocking at your door one way or the other. And as we were talking at lunch... 
if you really, as you begin to understand Mr. Uh, uh, Pluzenza, he visits very close to the Great Tribulation every time he goes to Africa. And believe me, he doesn't want to be here when the real thing hits. So I, I said, you know, he's got more motivation in a very visceral way to keep on the right track because you don't, none of us want to be one of those saying, oh, blankety blank, about an hour into the Great Tribulation. I emphasize the wrong things. I leaned to my own understanding. I was wise in my own opinion. I was self-willed. And God will say, "Uh uh-huh, you were. And you've got one chance left. And that breaks my heart. I, I just, I think back of all the people that I have fought long and hard in this Christian battle with over the years who have fallen away. Brethren, our goal is to make sure none of us ever fall away. We're part of the solution, not a part of the problem. Isaiah 2. The word of the, uh, that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Again, this is directed, thank you Diane, at uh, Judah and Jerusalem. Now it shall come to pass in the latter... Now this is one of the more poetic and positive, uh, evocative descriptions of the kingdom of God in the Bible. Don't become so overly familiar with this that it doesn't impact you emotionally because a lot of what we're talking about in the Minor Prophets and in Isaiah are horrible, terrible things. Um, It reduces me to tears sometimes when I think about the terrible things that are going to happen. And again, the only true message of hope is not some nutcase out there who says that Christ is going to return February 3rd, 2011. There are guys out there saying that. It is the the work of this work and the two witnesses that are going to actually be saying the truth. And that's going to be the only valid and real form of hope that six billion people on earth will hear as four billion of them die. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house, the mountain represents government, so God's government shall be established on the top of all the other mountains all the other governments, and shall be exalted above the hills, the smaller governments, and all nations shall flow to it. This was said in the time of Hezekiah, uh, or Amos, I'm sorry, uh, the, the, the time of Isaiah, but did it happen in the time of Isaiah? No, this did not have a prior fulfillment, by the way. Many people shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. We're going to go ask, by the way, who will they be asking? This is post-return of Christ. They will be asking you. Many people shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, the government of God, to the house of the God of Jacob. He... You, brethren, will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. We won't have elections. We won't have uh, political disputes. We won't have democracy. This is top-down government. And the word will come out of Zion, will go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he, that means you, will judge between the nations and rebuke many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Try and read that with a fresh mind. That is one of the most positive scriptures in the entire Bible. You, brethren, will judge between the nations. They won't like your judgment. They won't naturally identify with your judgment. And you'll have to rebuke many people because they won't accept it without a fight. And they shall beat, given the introduction, they're not going to willingly beat their swords into plowshares. You're going to have to make them. And their spears into pruning hooks. And through the generations that begin the millennium, we will raise up people who will not learn war anymore. Now, the generation we start out with, war is all they know. 
we're going to have to, to educate that out of them. And by the way, we're not going to succeed with that generation totally. We're going to have problems that you and I are going to have to deal with for years after Christ's return because these people are still unlearning war. And the next generation will have more success with and the generation after that more. Neither shall they learn... Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come and let us walk in the light of the Lord. For you have forsaken your people, the house of Jacob, because they are filled with eastern ways. The Babylonian religion is a religion of the east. Counterfeit Christianity is a Babylonian religion. That's what he's talking about. Because they are filled with eastern ways. They are soothsayers like the Philistines. They are pleased with the children of foreigners. He's talking about the religious, uh, when he says children of foreigners, he's talking about uh, religious leaders from other countries. I find it very, very interesting that as our country has declined, we did not have mosques all over our country in 1825. I don't know if there's a single mosque in the entire country. We cannot, uh, Americans cannot build a church in Saudi Arabia. But Saudi Arabians can build a mosque here. In fact, they're doing one right very close to 9-11, uh, the site of 9-11 in, uh, in New York. We are pleased with the children of foreigners. Their land is also full of silver and gold, and there's no end to their treasuries. Their land is also full of horses, and there's no end to their chariots. If you were brought from the time of Isaiah and flown over to Los Angeles, would this make a pretty good description? You wouldn't know what those cars were, but you would equate it with the closest you could think of, which would be a chariot. There's no... The land is... And, and frankly, you know, I'm amazed. Every time I go into a huge government complex or a huge medical complex to think this is a service industry. Meaning, it has to take money from somebody who produces wealth to be able to build a hospital or a huge government edifice. We are so filthy rich in this country, it boggles the mind. We have no end to our treasuries. Our land is full of horses, cars in this case, and there's no end to their chariots. Their land is also full of idols. In fact, many of those chariots are our idols. They worship the work of their own hands, which their own fingers have made. We're, he's describing a materialistic society, which is what we are today. People bow down and each man humbles himself. What is Isaiah's conclusion on this? Therefore, do not forgive them. Don't be merciful to these people. They don't deserve it. Enter into the rock and hide in the dust from the terror of the Lord and the glory of His majesty. The lofty... And here, I want to really stress the, uh, the pride aspect, the pride and arrogance. The lofty looks... Because we're going to hear this echoed throughout Isaiah. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down. The Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. Why does the Lord demand exaltation for himself alone? Is it because his ego needs stroking? God doesn't have ego. Not in that sense. It's because he's the only one who can handle it. We can't. And he knows that we have to, the same reason, you show respect to me when you call me Mr. Gilchrist. Now, I'm finally used to it after 11 years, but it took me a long time because I'm not Mr. Gilchrist to me. I'm Glenn. I'm one of you. I'm a lay member who happens to be a minister. I don't consider myself on a higher plane. It's hard for me to have you call me Mr. Gilchrist. You know why? I don't stress it. I, I don't even... Some ministers make everybody call them by their first name when they're not in the official church capacity. I don't do that. Because I understand the same thing God is showing here. We as humans need to be reminded of the difference between us and God, between us as lay members and the ministerial office. You're not respecting Glenn Gilchrist when you call me Mr. Gilchrist. You're respecting God. 
And I'll tell you, that humbles the dickens out of me that I'm the, the occupier of this office. I, don't, I know I'm not worthy of that kind of respect. But I commend every one of you. You guys are tremendous at it. Nobody fights me over that issue. I've had people, I remember down in Southwest, I had somebody give me a big argument over uh, you know, the use of Mr. Gilchrist as a title as opposed to my first name. They wanted to argue and fight over it. And I don't argue and fight over too much. But um, you know, the, the beauty of, of God's government at, when it operates the way it should is that the only authority I have over you as a minister is what you give me. I don't come and grab you by the, the, the uh, tie and, and tie, tighten that tie until you turn blue and demand you respect me. You give me your respect based upon your conversion through the Holy Spirit. It's a gift. It's granted authority. I always am awed by that. So anyway, God doesn't need stroking. He doesn't need his ego stroked or built up. The, the humanity needs humbling and needs to recognize who is God. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. By the way, that's you. You're going to be that Lord that is exalted. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall come upon everything proud and lofty. Now isn't it interesting here we talk about the day of the Lord and God says the primary target will be upon everything proud and lofty. Again, I'm going to just stress how often we're going to hear that kind of a theme through the book of Isaiah. The day of the Lord of hosts shall come upon everything proud and lofty, upon everything lifted up, and it shall be brought low. Upon the cedars of Lebanon, high and lifted up, and upon all the oaks of Bashan. He's not talking about trees here. He's talking about people who uh, are consider themselves the elite, the exalted ones. The tree, cedars of Lebanon is a, is a metaphor of that. And he uses the oaks of Bashan in many places, along this, or the cows of Bashan, when he's talking about the women, by the way, um, in, along the same line. Upon all the high mountains, upon all the hills that are lifted up, God is going to abase every government. Upon every high tower and every fortified wall, upon the shi- all the ships of Tarshish and all the beautiful sloops, the loftiness of man shall be bowed down and the haughtiness of men shall be brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. He just went out of his way at length to hit that theme twice. That I'm the only one who's going to be exalted, God says, or you are. And that the loftiness of man, the haughtiness, the arrogance, the pride, the vanity of man, I'm going to smash. What is that going to take? How great is the vanity and the haughtiness and the arrogance of mankind? It will take the great tribulation in the day of the Lord. To smash that that is how deeply that runs into the human psyche so I, I, I want to give that as a context to help you understand God takes no pleasure in what has to happen in the great tribulation and he does not make it go as far as it does mankind is the one who makes it go as far as it does he just knows it's going to go there The loftiness of man shall be bowed low, and the haughtiness of men shall be brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day, but the idols he will utterly abolish. They shall go into the holes of the rocks and the caves of the earth from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake the earth mightily. What is he talking about? Does that echo something you hear somewhere else? In the other prophecies, talking about going into the, uh, into the rocks and hiding in the caves of the earth from the terror of the Lord, the day of the Lord. And um, Revelation, right, uh, that's what I was thinking. And uh, it, have you got that verse right there? Okay. Uh, Revelation 6, 12 through... Okay, well, let, let's go to that real quick. Yeah. 
it's, it's, it's thematically the same, not the same wording, but uh, thematically the same. The sixth seal, and it says, uh, verse 12, I open up the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as black sackcloth of hair. The moon became like blood. And the stars of the heaven fell to the earth as a fig drops its late figs when it's shaken by a mighty wind. The sky receded like a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. In other words, the entire earth is in seismic movement. Now, one of the reasons I went, decided to continue in the book of Isaiah is these events are just right around the corner. And in some ways, brethren, I can't stress it enough. I, I don't want it to depress you. And by the way, you notice I'm not... I was talking to uh, Mr. Jewsbury about this earlier, that I'm not, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation up here with you know, the chart of prophecy on it. I personally think when you're trying to keep straight all the details of prophecy, that works much better in your personal study than it does in a sermon. To me, you start giving that much details. I don't know about your eyes, but my eyes gla- glaze over pretty quickly. I can't keep it straight. So I have to have that chart right in front of me. So I encourage all of you to study the uh, Beast of Revelation booklet and the things that has those charts in there and try to get into your mind the sequence of events that are going to happen. I don't think it's crucial you know exactly every detail and exactly everything that's going to happen. God isn't going to give you a multiple choice test before you go into a place of safety. But he is going to look at whether you're doing what he called you to do, which the work of God, submission to the government of God, that you're growing individually, you're taking your calling seriously. One of the reasons people fall away, as Mr. Ulrich mentioned in his sermon, is because they're not studying. They're not studying God's word. You and I need to be studying God's word so that when we face various things in life, it will come to mind because you put it there repeatedly. It isn't a case of you. I read the Bible once 30 years ago. There's nothing new in it. I don't need to read it again. That, uh, that's the kind of attitude that's going to be waking up in the Great Tribulation saying, oh, blankety blank. Uh, so, uh, no, our job is to make sure that we're doing the work God called us to do. We're being the witnesses and supporting that work with all of our hearts. Uh, and that we're uh, you know, working with the government of God, learning how to work with the government of God. We are personally and individually building our relationship with God through prayer, Bible study, meditation, and fasting so that when the time of spiritual trials come, you and I will have a spiritual reserve to draw upon. When you have no reserve, have you ever... um, It's almost like if your tank is already on empty and you have to flee, you're in trouble, right? Right? So the time for you to make sure your tank is full is before the time of trial comes upon us. So whatever these different issues, you know, I don't stress things for the fun of it. I stress things because they're vital to your and my enduring to the end. Um, and then it continues down, verse 16, it says to the rocks and the uh, mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. There's another scripture, I, I'm not sure where, that talks about casting out of their silver and their gold into the streets. Uh, that's kind of where we're going to be at. We, we where we're going to be, sorry. Um, when we... I, I, when people mention, they, they, they get a little envious of some of these big houses and fancy cars and everything that, that the wealthy have. I always say in a few years, those houses are going to rot just as well as your little bungalow is going to rot. Uh, and uh, it's not going to do them any good in the final analysis. So, uh, back to Isaiah 2. We'll just wrap up with chapter 2 and stop there for today. Um, Oh, in fact, that's... <laughs> okay, I knew there was a scripture that said this. Okay. They shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth from the terror of the Lord. This is verse 19, Isaiah chapter 2. When he arises to shake the earth mightily. In that day a man will cast away his idols of silver and his idols of gold which they made, each for himself to, to worship, to the moles and the bats, to go into the clefts of the rocks and into the crags of the rocky, rugged rocks from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake 
the earth mightily. Sever yourself from such a man whose breath is in his nostrils, for of what account is he? Now, that's kind of interesting that he ends the chapter with that particular... Well, of course, it wasn't a chapter break to him. But he ends that section with that kind of a comment. Don't heavily associate... Have you ever talked to somebody who feels like our primary job as Christians and is to be as ecumenical as possible with all the other groups? All the other groups are not paying attention to a lot of this. They don't much care about a lot of it. God doesn't say, oh, be as ecumenical as you can, be as inclusive as you can. Not that it's wrong to have relations with other groups. We're not Philadelphia here. I'm not saying that. Or we're not Joe Flurry's group. We are hopefully Philadelphian, but we're not Philadelphia. Because he, he, he requires people to break off contacts with their, with their close relatives. We don't require that, but I'm just saying, uh, there's another scripture I read, was it in Malachi that was saying the same thing about, you know, watch who you associate with, who your friends are, because they're going to influence you. Sever yourself from such a man whose breath is in his nostrils, for of what account is he? Somebody who's focused more on the things of, oh, yeah, it was a sermon I was given on the Ten Commandments or something. We're talking about mammon. You can't serve God and mammon. You can't serve God and the material world. There are some people, even people who claim to be a part of the Church of God, um, who are serving mammon more than they're serving God. Uh, there's another scripture that talks about don't associate with somebody even if he is called a brother who is sexually immoral or extortioner or whatever it might be. So, you know, the principle does run throughout the Bible. Pay attention to who you spend time with and who influences you because they will have an effect on you. Okay, any comments or questions before we close out? We'll start with uh, Isaiah 3 next time. Okay. Um, he's talking about uh, pagan relig- religious worship. Because in context, verse 8, their land is full of idols. They wor- uh, worship the work of their hands, which their own fingers have made. People bow down to these idols that they've created. That's what he's talking about. Right. Exactly. The process of worship, when you're worshiping an idol, is, uh, you know, you don't stand up and go like this when you, you, know, you, you worship an idol. You bow down, you do all the, the typical things you do in worshiping God, but you do it to a false god. Uh, and uh, frankly, if you look at what poor Egyptians had to go through, or the Babylonians, or the Assyrians in the, their pursuit of their religion, uh, the priests lived pretty high on the hog, but they really lorded it over the poor people who had to really humble themselves in their worship process. So. But nonetheless, that's what it's talking about. Okay, good to see everybody. See you next time. See everybody at the Luau tomorrow, hopefully. Thank you.